we are after 10 or 11 other lessons, we ended up at what to invest in. We've looked at why to invest in regenerative agriculture and food, how to invest, and now we have arrived to what to invest to. And we are going to look at a number of different parts of the regenerative agriculture and food space. We're going to look at a number of different parts of the regenerative food and agriculture space. And in this lesson, we look at land. It's not investment advice. Seek professional advice before making any investments. And just to be clear, I'm a small retail investor. I don't have any money invested in the funds we might mention in the um, ag tech companies. I'm a very small retail investor. I haven't done due diligence on these uh, funds. And I will always mention when I have a special relationship with any of the companies. For instance, when I'm an, an advisor or, is, or if there's an introduction fee. This is not investment advice. This is meant to help you ask better questions, to go deeper and to connect you with people that are building potentially interesting things. So we're gonna look at a number of pieces of the regenerative agriculture space and see uh, what to invest in. And we're gonna start with buying land, land, buying it and regenerating it. It's probably the most developed part of the regenerative agriculture sector, especially when you look from the investment part. There are quite a few people that have bought land and regenerating it. And there are quite a few funds, like vehicles that you can, with large amount of money, you can put money to work to buying land and regenerating it. There are a number of examples like Agriculture Capital that has raised over 800 million um, across two funds. SLM who has raised over 100 million for an holistic grazing fund in Australia has raised quite a bit for a forestry fund in Ireland. One, two, three has raised more than 200 million um, for agroforestry, sustainable agroforestry, and Farmland OP, which was one of the first that really um, developed this model of buying land and regenerating it, which I think raised over 160 million so far. The model is very simple, not easy, but simple. You buy land, degraded land, you, because of management changes, maybe because of some investments, you regenerate, regenerate it, and depending on the structure of the fund, you sell it at some point. The, it's very, very similar. Why probably it got off the ground so much? It's very similar to a lot of real estate investments. You buy a very rundown building, you fix it, you put the LEDs, you put the solar panels, etc., and you rent it out. And either you get a very long-term consistent um, return or you sell it at some point and you get your return through that. I think it's a very good first phase of the regenerative agriculture and food space, but there are a few uh, caveats or a few uh, tension points I would like to point out. First of all, ownership. There's a huge general discussion. Who is allowed to own land? Why is land that used to be commons now owned by a few people? The concentration of wealth, the concentration of land in a few hands, um, the distance from people in the city to land, etc., etc., etc. That only increases because of these funds, because they usually get bit pretty big with institutional capital. So I think we ought to have, and we are already having, a discussion on land ownership. Who should own land and should people be allowed to speculate on land? And as somebody very famous said, they're not making any more of it. In this time of great distress, what's the commons? How, what, what other uh, non-ownership models are out there? And there are actually quite a few if you're interested in that. And I think the limits. There's a limit, limited amount of land for sale and there's a limit in the next, let's say 10, 15 years, and there's a limited amount of money to buy it. Even though you hear billions flowing around uh, and institutional investors probably will put quite a bit of money in this space, it's still very, very limited. Because if you look at the impact we need to have on the amount of hectares or acres on soil, biodiversity, nutrients, and water to really have an impact on, let's say global climate, global healthcare, um, we need way more. We need way more hectares to start making a regenerative transition or start be, starting being managed in a regenerative way or using regenerative practices. So the next 10, 15 years, I don't think there's going to be even enough land on the market and probably for crazy prices because there's still a huge bubble going on, completely not connected to the productive capacity of the land, that we can buy enough as society, and even if we would fix the ownership structure, to buy enough to actually make a huge um, movement with the needle that we need. So to summarize, it's a great first phase and there's a lot of experimentation going. These are often large plots and these funds and these vehicles train a lot of farmers. 
can be quite profitable to do this. So I think it's going to show, it's going to hopefully get a lot of investors into the space that normally wouldn't have been there. It's great for institutional capital, which often really, really struggles to get into smaller pieces, smaller deals, smaller investments, et cetera. These are places where you can write 100, 200 million checks. Um, and it preps the buyer industry. It preps the suppliers um, or the, the off takers. It preps the large companies that need or are interested in regenerative ingredients to start buying, contracting, off-take agreements, et cetera. So it's, a, it's, I think, a great first phase, a great prep with a number of tension points that we mentioned before that we should definitely explore. Doesn't mean we shouldn't engage. We should definitely explore these and, and learn and keep them accountable for soil measures because everyone is now men men mentioning on their decks, you for sure have seen it, uh, that they're measuring soil health or that they are regenerative agriculture farms and that they are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Usually two or three questions in, you notice if they are serious or not. And um, so it's up to us, investors, small, big, et cetera, to keep asking those questions and keep them accountable. If you want to dig deeper, a number of interviews, we've done many in this space, um, but I would just highlight three. Tony Lovell, um, who set up together with Paul McMahon, the SLM fund in Australia. Very, very interesting. I, I interviewed him twice, and this is the second interview where you see how they handled the six driest years on record. One, two, three, mentioned before, Oliver Henke goes deep into uh, their 150 million that they invested so far, but they're closing to, closer to 200 million now for an institutional German investor, a pension fund, into sustainable agroforestry, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, etc. And agriculture capital, um, they've raised over 800 million into perennial crops, so tree crops so far, very sustainable, and they are figuring out, thinking about, planning their next fund, and we had a discussion on how that could look like. And on one, two, three, probably by the time you're watching this, we'll have another interview out with the CEO, uh, Richard Falcon, who should, uh, which should be online. So check out the website for sure. I've been um, trying to update a list recent, uh, update a list continuously with funds that are measuring soil health and that are, I think, partly transforming agriculture. So you can check out this Medium post where, which connects to the Google Drive, basically the Google Doc, sorry, the Google Sheet that has this list. And you also find links to interviews when we've done them with them. And Farmland LP, uh, probably the first investment fund that uh, was active uh, or is active in this space, raised, I think, over 160 million so far. And now, actually, when I interviewed them, it was two years ago. So now they've, they've started actually more than 10 years ago, which is quite inspiring. <laughs>